In the first half of the 20th century, mankind witnessed warfare at a level beyond what anyone could imagine. Two world wars would alter the course of civilization forever. In Europe, peaceful woodlands and pastures became horrific battlefields. Cities, once thriving with culture, were reduced to ruins. Over the course of two wars, 1.7 million Canadians left their nation to defend our freedom and the liberty of others. In the end, 116,000 would never return. As a generation of Canadians who witnessed the horror of two world wars passes into eternity, who will continue to care for the memory of those who were killed in action? I think it's always um, extremely important that people remember what young men did and also to remember that um, at the end of the day, uh, young men died. Uh, you know, war is not a glorious thing, it's a horrible thing. And it's nice for, for many people to come to this uh, cemetery and see what Canadians did, you know, for Europe, what they've suffered and what a lot of people suffered. The graves of Canadian military personnel killed in action lie in finely maintained commemorative cemeteries. Their headstones, with the iconic maple leaf engraved in white Portland stone, signify yet another soldier who would never return home. Unlike any previous conflicts in history, thousands would lose their lives while at sea, in the air, or in the trenches. The changing methods of warfare presented new challenges to those responsible for the remains of servicemen killed in action. The overwhelming number of casualties experienced during both world wars challenged the notion of whether a country should bury their war dead in foreign lands. Though many families struggled with the thought of burying their loved ones overseas, it was decided that a fellowship in death that crossed all boundaries of race, creed, or wealth would be followed. And through the duration of both world wars, every soldier killed in action was buried overseas. During the First World War, Fabian Ware, a British major, arrived in France to take charge of a Red Cross mobile unit. While caring for the casualties brought in from the surrounding battlefields, he became aware of the lack of organization involved in recording the graves of soldiers. As a result of his efforts to honor the memory of the fallen, an organization known as the Commonwealth War Graves Commission was formed. Today, the Commission is responsible for the care and maintenance of over 1,700,000 burials in 149 countries. In a sense, it's like passing on the torch because it's not just about working for an organization, it's about working for a whole movement of people who are committed to um, maintaining the memory of those who gave such a great sacrifice for all of us. At every Commonwealth cemetery, visitors will find familiar features, like the cross of sacrifice rising over neat rows of headstones. The simple limestone cross symbolizing the spiritual faith of the majority. And the sword on its face, representing every cemetery's military character. In cemeteries containing over a thousand burials is the Stone of Remembrance designed to commemorate those of all faiths and none. The phrase inscribed in the stone speaks for all, 
their name liveth forevermore. It's almost very um, meditative coming here and, and spiritual, and I love the fact that they've taken such amazing care of this place here. It's just every single grave, each beautifully manicured with flowers and pictures and flags. It just makes you feel proud to know that they obviously cherish it, and we love that they cherish it. When Germany invaded Belgium in 1914, young Canadians rushed to enlist thinking the war would be over before they arrived in Europe. Soon, thousands of troops were heading for foreign lands. Every community in every province across the country awaited news of their young fighting men overseas. And for many, the news they received from the front was devastating. In Northern Europe, hundreds of thousands of soldiers fighting in miserable conditions were forced to dig in and wage the brutal battles associated with trench warfare. The war would not end quickly, and as a result, vast numbers of casualties were sustained by both sides. During the First World War, one out of every three casualties would succumb to their wounds. Many Commonwealth soldiers who died on their way to hospital or at casualty clearing stations were buried at cemeteries located not far from the front lines. Leesenhoek Military Cemetery is the second largest Commonwealth cemetery in Belgium. It contains the graves of over 10,000 soldiers of the First World War. A distinction of military hospital cemeteries is that soldiers' remains were buried very close together. It is common to see entire rows of headstones where the relationship among soldiers isn't necessarily country or regiment, but that they were one of many that died in hospital on that day. Over 1,000 Canadians are buried here. Many who perished from wounds suffered in famous battles such as Mount Sorrel and Passchendaele. Private Charles Labrador, a Mi'kmaq native from Nova Scotia, was killed while serving with the 25th Canadian Infantry Battalion. Only 20 years old, he died of his wounds on the 27th of July, 1916. When I first found his grave, it was um, really emotional for me uh, to be able to uh, travel over there and find my great uncle who I always knew had been killed but um, to see a Labrador amongst all those uh, grave and headstones was, was really emotional for me and also I'm the only one in my family that I know of that ever went over there and actually went to his grave. Like many villages near the front lines of the Ypres salient, Vormazella, Belgium, was completely destroyed by relentless artillery fire, while each side fought to control the area. The high number of casualties and the continuous fighting led soldiers to bury their dead in often appalling conditions not far from the battlefield. Today, the cemetery seems to be just as much a part of Vormazella as the homes that line the quiet streets. Just over its walls in all directions are the backyards of the town's residents. Buried here is Carl St. Clair Walker of Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, who served with the Canadian pioneers. He was killed in action on April 11, 1916. Uh, I was told that uh, he had already been wounded and they were bringing him on a stretcher to the first aid post and that a sniper had shot two stretcher bearers and also shot him through the heart. The first time I visited his grave was in uh, 1978. I'd been posted to Germany in 77, so my mother had come over and we went to visit his grave. And it was the first time anybody from the family had visited his grave. The few possessions that Carl carried with him were returned to his parents and they remain cherished by his family. The one postcard was sent in March of 1916 to him, and he was on him personally when he was shot. When you see it, the corners are cut off it because his blood had soaked into it 
and they didn't want to give it to the family that way. At dawn on April 9th, 1917, over 100,000 soldiers took part in the Battle of Vimy Ridge, an event that has become etched in the Canadian psyche as one of our finest military achievements. Numerous attempts by the British to capture Vimy Ridge had earned the German position a reputation of being unconquerable. The four Canadian divisions, who were operating together for the first time in the war, captured the heavily fortified position within days. On the north side of Vimy Ridge lies La Chaudière Cemetery. Among the 908 Commonwealth burials lies the remains of 638 Canadians who gave their lives during the vicious fighting of April 1917. La Chaudière's finely maintained brick walls and majestic maple trees mark the boundary of the quiet country cemetery. Visitors who pay their respect near the Cross of Sacrifice will identify the twin white columns of the Canadian National Vimy Memorial in the distance. A reminder that victory was not attained without a great cost. One of the 3,598 soldiers killed during the assault on Vimy Ridge was Private Campbell McCaskill of Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Serving in the Royal Canadian Regiment, he was killed in action within the first hours of the attack. Private McCaskill was only 22 years old. Located at the highest point of the ridge is the Vimy Memorial. Today, one can still see the pock-marked ground, a result of the relentless artillery barrage that preceded the Canadian offensive in April 1917. A portion of the Canadian and German trenches have been preserved, so visitors may appreciate how close the front lines were. People picture this vast expanse between the two trenches, but it's tiny. And just looking across the expanse today, you just have to picture people trying to cross it. The fact that there is no trees, no grass, it was just mud, and then they would see the bodies in there and know that if they tried to cross, that that might be them. Miles of tunnels lie beneath the grounds of Vimy Ridge, one of which was occupied by members of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry on the night before the historic battle. People are down there for 36 hours in silence and darkness. You can only imagine what was going through their heads, what they were thinking about when they're hearing all these bombardments and to have the energy as well as the courage afterwards to go up and try to take this ridge, I think is something that's admirable and it's why I'm here today and telling their stories. Engraved in a tunnel wall is the familiar shape of a maple leaf. While the fate of the Canadian soldier who carved the symbol is unknown, his work lives on to symbolize the beginning of a nation's identity. The monument that now dominates the ridge is the focal point of any visit to this historic site. Adorned with impressive sculptures, most poignant is the figure of a soaring woman. Carved from a 30-ton block of stone, she represents Canada, a young nation who is mourning her dead. More than 7,000 Canadians are buried in 30 war cemeteries within 20 kilometers of the Vimy Memorial. One of those is Cabaret Rouge British Cemetery, where many of the Canadians killed in the Battle of Vimy Ridge are buried. This magnificent cemetery designed by Canadian Frank Higginson has dramatic views of the surrounding hills which were once the scene of fierce fighting.
In May of 2000, the grave of an unknown Canadian soldier buried at Cabaret Rouge was chosen for an extraordinary honour. A special headstone now marks the location of the grave that once held Canada's unknown soldier. His remains were returned to Canada and now rest in a special tomb at the foot of the National War Memorial in Ottawa. While the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier serves as a monument to the sacrifice of all the unknown dead, there are also countless stories of sacrifice that are shared among the names on each gravestone. Privates Roderick McLennan and Lockie Livingston grew up only a short distance from each other in Bolidry Island in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Both men enlisted and were sent to France as part of the 85th Battalion. In the spring of 1917, both men were killed during the Battle of Arras. Now, just as they shared the same hometown, they lie only five graves apart in the Cabaret Rouge British Cemetery. As a result of the impressive victory at Vimy Ridge, the Canadian Corps was called on once again, this time in the Ypres salient. The fighting ahead took place in some of the most appalling battlefield conditions of the war. The Canadian Corps would pay dearly for this victory, with over 15,000 casualties in what would be remembered as the Battle of Passchendaele. Tynecott Cemetery in Belgium is where many of the casualties of the Battle of Passchendaele are buried. Tynecott is the largest Commonwealth War Graves Cemetery in the world, with 12,000, just under 12,000 soldiers buried here, and uh, with 35,000 names on the memorial in the wall. It is truly overwhelming to contemplate so many horrific deaths, even while standing among the seemingly countless rows of headstones. Today, visitors can reflect upon the astonishing number of unidentified grave markers as more than 8,000 graves at Tynecott share the familiar inscription, known unto God. The scarred remnants of two German concrete bunkers located within Tynecott serve as reminders that this area was once a battlefield. A third bunker now enclosed by the cemetery's cross of sacrifice is near some of the first burials at Tyne Cot. These original battlefield graves illustrate the chaos often associated with burying casualties near the front lines. The victory at Passchendaele was not achieved without extraordinary acts of bravery. The Commonwealth's highest military decoration awarded for valor in the face of the enemy is the Victoria Cross. Victoria Crosses were awarded for instances of rare bravery above and beyond the call of duty. There are instances of private soldiers seizing the initiative, natural born leaders standing up when officers and NCOs aren't moving and leading them forward. In many, many cases, of course, the Victoria Cross was awarded posthumously. Buried at Tynecott Cemetery is Canadian Victoria Cross recipient, Private James Peter Robertson. Robertson's company was held up by a German machine gun nest. Without being asked, uh, Robertson jumped up, charged ahead, captured this machine gun nest, took the machine gun after having killed a few of the Germans, and followed the retreating Germans into the town, firing the machine gun. Later that day, when the uh, advance had come to a halt, uh, Robertson was told that there was a wounded Canadian soldier out in no man's land. Without being asked, without being told, he jumped up, ran out into no man's land, picked up the wounded soldier, brought him back into Canadian lines. There was another Canadian soldier out there. He went out again into no man's land. As he was about to pick him up, he was wounded, but somehow he got the soldier onto his shoulders and as he almost reached the Canadian lines, a German shell exploded nearby and Robertson and the soldier he was carrying were killed instantly, and for his bravery and heroism, Robertson was awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross.
On the memorial to the missing is another Canadian Victoria Cross recipient, Lieutenant Colonel Philip Eric Bent. Philip Bent was the only Victoria Cross recipient born in Halifax. Now, on October the 1st, 1917, as part of the Third Battle of Ypres, uh, Bent's battalion was being pushed back on both the left and the right flank. He's back in the center with his battalion headquarters. He thinks that the situation is turning very hopeless. So he rallies his headquarters people, their cooks, his reserve soldiers, and he charges forward. He restores the situation, pushes the Germans back, holds the line, and at the last minute, sometime during this battle, unknown because his body was never recovered, he's killed. And he's posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross, and his sword hangs in the Cathedral Church of All Saints in Halifax today. As a tribute of remembrance to the 100,000 soldiers who perished in the miserable conditions of the Ypres salient and who have no known grave, special memorials honor their names. One of the most impressive is the Menin Gate, located in the city of Ypres, Belgium. The Menin Gate sits over the road in which hundreds of thousands of troops made their way to the front lines. More than 55,000 names of Commonwealth soldiers are inscribed on the memorial walls. 6,940 are Canadian. Their final resting place unknown. I visited uh, the Menin Gate for the first time in 1965 as a young Scottish lad with a Scottish pipe band. Uh, we were in the area visiting uh, various war graves, war cemeteries. Uh, and we came to the Menin Gate and we were all astonished that 54,000 people could just disappear without no known grave. And in, in effect, this is when the war meant something to us because although we had learned in school about the history of the First and Second World War, it only meant something, only became tangible by seeing the Menin Gate and other cemeteries like Tyne Cot, where we became to realise the sacrifice that was given at the time. Lance Corporal William Harold Rulin and Private Everard Wenzel have two memorial inscriptions in common. One in their hometown of Mahome Bay, Nova Scotia, and the other on the Menin Gate in Ypres, Belgium. Lance Corporal William Rulin and Private Everard Wenzel, both from Mahome Bay, they both, both joined, I think it was on the same day, but at the same time, and they both end up in the 85th Battalion. They uh, both fight together at Vimy, and they were both killed together at, at Passchendaele in the same battle. And in both cases, their bodies were not recovered, and both of them had their names on the Menin Gate. Each evening at 8 p.m., all traffic through the gateway is halted as buglers sound the last post. This peaceful ceremony has taken place daily since November 11th, 1929. In the spring of 1918, Germany launched a series of large-scale attacks along the Western Front. The massive spring offensive was strengthened by a reserve of nearly 50 German divisions that had returned from the Eastern Front. In the village of Wye, France, is Wye Orchard Cemetery. Established by the British Army in 1916, this burial ground was considerably enlarged by Canadian units defending the area during the German Spring Offensive. Wye Orchard Cemetery should be of particular interest to Nova Scotians. Many of the young soldiers buried here were part of the 25th Battalion which was formed by men who enlisted from small towns across Nova Scotia. Not far from this location, Daniel Livingston, a lieutenant with the 25th Battalion, was killed by an enemy sniper in no man's land. 
at Y.E. Orchard Cemetery, his brother Harrison, then only 20 years old and already a veteran of two years of action in the trenches, watched as his older brother, wrapped in burlap, was laid to rest. Those soldiers of Nova Scotia's 25th Battalion, buried at Y.E. Orchard Cemetery, whisper a familiar and important story of remembrance to every province in Canada. By mid-July of 1918, the German Spring Offensive was stalling. On August 8th, the Canadian and Australian Corps led an attack, which in the first day punched a 24-kilometer gap in the enemy lines. The attack was considered a complete success, and this date is referred to as the Black Day for the German Army. The objectives achieved on August 8th marked the beginning of the Hundred Days Offensive, which would decisively turn the tide of World War I. Hangard Wood British Cemetery, situated in the Somme region of France, was once a location occupied by the German Army. This area was the scene of brutal fighting as the Canadian Corps swept through the area, marking the start of the Hundred Days Offensive. Only the distant site of a small cemetery gives clues to the horrors once experienced here. One of the Canadian soldiers buried here at Hangard Wood received the Victoria Cross for his valor. August the 8th, 1918, the Battle of Amiens. It's the great last Allied advance of the war. And the 13th Battalion, of which Johnny Croke is a part, is now leading. So Johnny Croke comes across a machine gun nest. His platoon is pinned down. Croke grips the situation, charges forward, bayonets the Germans, takes the nest, is wounded in the process. Now legitimately, Johnny Croak could have gone to the rear and had his wounds dressed, but he didn't. He stayed with his platoon. The advance continued again. Same situation, they come up against another machine gun nest. The platoon is held up. Croak again, single-handedly, charges the machine gun nest, takes out the Germans, but in the process is fatally wounded. He only lives for a few minutes after this. Uh, one of his buddies comes up beside him, and Croak's dying words to his buddy were, do you wish to show your gratitude? Then kneel down and pray for my soul. By late August 1918, it was clear that the German army was in trouble. The Canadian Corps continued advancing and soon began to liberate territory that had been under German occupation since the beginning of the war. The German troops, however, continued to fight in a last effort to retain their captured ground in France. Located in the Pas de Calais region of France is Vienne Artois British Cemetery. Walking among the graves here, you will see the familiar designation of the 85th Battalion on stone after stone. Well, the 85th Battalion was originally envisaged as one of four battalions in a Nova Scotia Highland Brigade. And there were actually four Highland Battalions that formed this brigade. Now the 85th Battalion came online very late in the war. And its first battle was at Vimy Ridge in, on Easter Monday, uh, April the 9th, 1917. There was one feature that remained uncaptured, and that was Hill 145. The brigade commander uh, of the 85th volunteered them. The 85th Battalion swept up over Hill 145, over the top, routed the Germans, and seized the objective. World War I officially ended on November 11th, 1918. And for many Canadians who lost loved ones, 
the returning soldiers became further reminders that life would never be the same. With so many sons buried overseas, public memorials became important shrines of remembrance to many relatives of the fallen. Some families struggling to fill the void chose special tributes to those they lost. The Livingston Memorial on Bolidry Island in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia is an important reminder of one family's grief. This impressive marker was erected here by the Livingston family of Southside of Bolidry after the First World War. It honors three brothers all killed in the Great War, each of them at a famous a battle site, Ypres, a Corselet, and Cambrai. The first of the brothers was Private Hugh Livingston, who had enlisted at Winnipeg in the 43rd Infantry Battalion. He was a lumberman at the time of his enlistment. He also was a soldier who had been diagnosed with something that the Army brass and medical staff called neurasthenia. Now, neurasthenia was a code word for something that the ordinary soldier knew far better as shell shock. He was treated for his shell shock and was returned to the trenches, suffered his gunshot wounds earlier in August of 1916, died as a consequence of those wounds and is buried at the very large military hospital a cemetery, Leishentuk, which is just west of Ypres. Just two months afterwards, his brother Charles died fighting in the Battle of Corselet. Charles Livingston was a 1906 uh, graduate of the Dalhousie Law School. Around about 1908 to 1910, he moved west. He lived and practiced in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. And in fact, shortly before the war, he also ran for parliament in the general election of 1911 as a conservative, and he was trounced by the Laurier Liberals. Major Charles Livingston is buried with 150 fellow Canadians within the impressive Pozier British Cemetery, located in the Somme region of France. The final words of a dying soldier are precious to the family left behind, and Charles was able to speak to a friend before he passed on. His uh, dying words were recorded by a fellow officer named uh, Bradbrook. He said, well, I'm done. I've done my best for the company. Please tell father. Two years later, the family would lose yet another son. David Livingston, like Charles, was studying law at Dalhousie University when he joined the Canadian Expeditionary Force. David had enlisted in the 185th Battalion, the Cape Breton Highlanders. But by the last 100 days of the war, he was serving in the Motor Machine Gun Battalion. Just about a month before the armistice and the fighting for the city of Cambrai, his motor machine gun unit was spotted by the Germans and he was killed, along with a small number of others by German shell fire. Lieutenant David Livingston is buried within Heine Corps British Cemetery, along with over 250 fellow Canadians. In such a serene location, one can imagine the grief that each family went through upon hearing about the death of their loved one. But for the family of David Livingston, the news was especially hard. The family legend is that David was the favorite of his father. The father died November the 6th of 1918, less than a month after David was killed in action near Cambrai. Having lost two sons in 1916, and to lose a third son late in the war in 1918 was just too much for the father to bear. Family sources say that he died of a broken heart only days after receiving the word that David was lost. The sad result of World War I is the loss of young Canadians and their unrealized potential. Their sacrifice, memorialized on plaques located in small towns, remind us that families and communities across our nation 
gave their best. World War I proved that technology had forever changed the nature of warfare. Advanced weaponry enabled armies to kill men in unprecedented numbers. It was believed that this bloodshed would never be repeated. Some proclaimed that this was the war to end all wars. Sadly, only 21 years later, the Second World War would begin, compelling a new generation of soldiers to confront a familiar adversary, the mighty German military. By December 1939, the first Canadian soldiers had arrived in the United Kingdom. Their first test would be a raid on the French coast at Dieppe, planned for August 19, 1942. The raid, which included 5,000 Canadian soldiers, lost the element of surprise when by chance, a German coastal convoy crossed paths with some of the very first landing crafts. When the battle ended, 907 Canadian soldiers had lost their lives. In the aftermath, Allied generals learned valuable lessons that would be used in future battle plans. Over six decades later, remnants of the German occupation and the Canadian raid on Dieppe remain visible. These artifacts remain as silent witnesses to the horror once experienced at this beautiful coastal town. Dieppe Canadian War Cemetery is where many of the soldiers killed during the battle are buried. The quiet cemetery located on the edge of town is situated not far from where many lost their lives. Dieppe Canadian War Cemetery is unique among the many Commonwealth cemeteries in France, as its creation was overseen by the occupying German forces. Canadian soldiers are buried here in long rows in the unique back-to-back -back headstone configuration, typical of German military burials. When forces liberated the town in 1944, the Allies decided that the cemetery would be left undisturbed. And today, visitors will see the cemetery in the way it was created. The sad reality of the raid on Dieppe is illustrated by the frequent appearance of August 19, 1942, the date which is inscribed on almost every gravestone in the cemetery. The lessons learned from this invasion of France would be incorporated into the planning of yet another beach invasion that would see Canada once again called on to man the landing crafts, this time as part of the largest amphibious invasion in history. By June 1944, 30,000 Canadians were trained and ready to participate in Operation Overlord the long-awaited invasion of the French coast. On D-Day, the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division landed at Juneau Beach. The plan called for the Canadians to establish a beachhead, capture three small seaside towns, and advance 10 miles inland. The assault was a formidable task for the Canadians, as the Germans had built an extensive system of coastal defences, known as the Atlantic Wall. Located four kilometers south of Juneau Beach is Benny sur Mer Canadian War Cemetery, the final resting place for Canadian servicemen killed in action on D-Day and in the subsequent days of the invasion. These were the soldiers of the Canadian 3rd Division and the 2nd Armoured Brigade. They represent the pride of an entire nation. This is predominantly a Canadian cemetery. There's 2,444 Canadians buried here in uh, Benny, and uh, there's four British soldiers and one French civilian. Many of the Canadian soldiers killed at Juneau Beach on June 6th were buried at Benny-sur-Mer. 
including sapper Arthur Thomas Jackson, who enlisted in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia in July of 1941. Tragically, he became one of the 340 Canadians killed on the beaches of Normandy during the first day of the invasion. Also buried within Benny Sumer are the remains of nine sets of brothers. The graves of the three Westlake brothers, George, Tommy, and Albert of Toronto, Ontario, are poignant reminders of the tragic loss suffered by many Canadians who lost more than one family member. Among the graves of Benny Sumer are the unfortunate victims of Kurt Meyer's 12th SS Panzer Division. These members of the North Novies were taken prisoner and executed one by one at the Abbey Dardenne on the 7th of June, 1944. Canadian studies teacher Gary Renouf has organized class trips to Benny Sumer on several occasions, and he understands the importance of the lessons his students can learn. I hope that these profiles and these trips and the projects and whatnot give them a sense of connection uh, with history so that they can understand that, yeah, events that happened 50 years ago or 100 years ago um, still have meaning today for them um, as individuals and as Canadians. One of my students who signed up in 2007 was Rebecca Bigelow. She wanted to profile her great uncle, Fred Vincent Bigelow. The local newspaper normally comes in and does a follow-up story with us when we come back from Europe. The reporter emailed me and she said, um, I got this email. She said, I'm not really sure how I should proceed with this. The email was from a gentleman in England, a uh, fellow by the name of Ian Vincent Marriott. And uh, as the story goes, apparently he was Fred's son. So I guess in the process of kind of researching his father, he stumbled upon the newspaper article that would have been in the Toronto Daily News. And so Rebecca got to meet the second cousin that she never knew she had. In the early summer of 1944, the first Canadian Army moved steadily inland from Juneau Beach. Near the town of Falaise, Canadian forces found themselves involved in an operation designed to entrap nearly 50,000 German troops. The resulting attack, now known as the Battle of the Falaise Pocket, destroyed the bulk of German forces in the area, which eventually led to the liberation of Paris. Bretville sur Lays Canadian Cemetery lies between the towns of Caen and Falaise. The sizable painted maple leaf illustrates the importance of the cemetery to Canada. The soldiers buried here represent almost every unit of the Canadian Second Corps. An emotional aspect of any visit to a Commonwealth cemetery is reading the personal inscriptions on gravestones. The grief-filled sentiments serve as lasting reminders of the pain endured by family members back home. I always take the time to read the personal inscriptions because some of them are coming straight from the heart of the person and I find those, they sort of grasp you and you're there rereading it over and over again. And, and so that's why I get, I, I, sometimes there are tear jerkers when you do read some of the personal inscriptions. Members of the Royal Canadian Air Force served with distinction during World War II. The RCAF's greatest contribution overall was to Bomber Command. Number six Bomber Group flew countless missions over Northwest Europe. German fighter planes and anti-aircraft fire knocked thousands of bombers from the sky. These crippled bombers often crash landed in remote areas of Europe while surviving crew members attempted to evade capture. 
those airmen who perished were often buried in communal cemeteries not far from their crash sites. A land communal cemetery contains a single Commonwealth war grave. The remains of RCF bomber pilot Frank Tomlinson were recovered by townspeople shortly after his bomber crash landed into the nearby hills. His grave is the only Commonwealth War grave burial in the town's cemetery. March 9th, 1943, Frank and his crew were scheduled for a bombing run in Munich, Germany. They uh, were to fly across France, uh, the lower part of Belgium, into Germany. Uh, in the Ardennes area of France, they were hit by a night fighter, uh, caught fire. Frank did everything he could to get it out. Uh, he basically took a dive to try to get the air stream to put the fire out, uh, was unable to do so. So he uh, told the crew to jump, basically to bail out. The crew all got out safely, except Frank. We're not sure whether Frank uh, tried to get out and couldn't, or whether he decided to ride it down and you know, take whatever came. I think he was just doing what hundreds of other men did. I think he saved his men, but uh, so did a lot of us. With established positions in France, the Canadian First Army was directed back towards the coast. Their objective was to clear the enemy out of the coastal towns and ports of northern France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. As the troops advanced, they were met by enemy forces that were determined to keep the Allies away from German soil. By February 1945, Canadian and British soldiers were advancing deep into Holland. The ground war would finally reach Germany. World War II would end with Germany's unconditional surrender on May 8, 1945. Grosbeek Canadian War Cemetery would be the final resting place of Canadian soldiers who were killed during the closing stages of World War II. There are more Canadians buried in Grosbeek than any other cemetery in the Netherlands. The Canadians, yeah, they liberated us along with, with, with the Americans and the British troops, but we've got our Canadian cemetery here. It's our cemetery. That's what the, the, the people here in, in, in Grosbeek feel. And I think they are proud to, to have it here on this spot. Within the cemetery stands the Groves Beak Memorial, which commemorates the names of more than 1,000 members of the Commonwealth Land Forces, whose graves are unknown. 103 of these names are Canadians. Many of the men buried here were some of the last casualties of World War II. So unfortunate are the stories of soldiers who almost made it to the end. Men like Private Richard Beasley of Hansport, Nova Scotia, who had so many reasons to return home. Well, he was killed on February 26th in Operation Blockbuster, but we didn't find out until March 8th when we got a telegram from Canadian Pacific Railways. My mother and my aunt took me aside told me my father had been killed in the war and he wouldn't be coming back again. Less and his younger brothers, Richard and Wayne, continue to share memories of their father who was killed in action more than 67 years ago, on February 26, 1945. I very clearly remember standing in the kitchen looking out the window and he started headed down toward town. He turned and waved to us. And that's my last memory of actually seeing our father. Our father uh, sent 
mom roses on Valentine's Day, and uh, he was killed on the 26th. She got the telegram March 8th. The next day, the dozen roses show up. She got them the day after. She got the telegram about him being killed, so he was still thinking about her. Over the years, the three sons have all had the chance to visit their father's grave. Richard remembers the occasion when his mother finally had the opportunity to say goodbye. To go there and take our mother, who had never been there, it was a really uh, unforgettable experience to go there with her. As we were leaving, she said, I never thought your father should have been buried here, but now I know it's the place where he should have been buried. And she said, part of my life can now be closed, and I feel really at peace with it. In the future, who will remember the sacrifices of our country's soldiers from both world wars. It's important for the youth of today to realize that we need to commemorate these people. They've sacrificed part of their lives. In terms of the war dead, they sacrificed their lives. But in terms of the veterans, they, they sacrificed a part of their life. They sacrificed their youth in order for the youth today to be able to live in the world that we do live in. And we need to cherish that. And that's why it's so important to commemorate these men and women who have done that before us. As the sun rises on Juneau Beach and sets on Vimy Ridge, and the wars of the 20th century slip further into history, will society continue to recognize the importance of Commonwealth cemeteries? I really do hope that the youth continue to come here because we have no more veterans left in Canada from the First World War. So it's up to people like myself today to be telling these stories and for people to come and listen to them and to carry them on in future generations. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemeteries and the stories of the soldiers buried within are reminders to future generations of what we lose when we go to war. While how we remember is important, visiting these memorials, experiencing the endless rows of headstones, and contemplating the overwhelming loss of life will always speak louder than words.